streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill, as the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. As a shadow
It's nice to see so many people here today. It's a blessed day. It's the day that the Lord has made for fellowship and worship. And I'm so thankful to see so many of you here. We're going to be studying in this, the second of our series, about the testimony of Jesus. However, before we do, we want to ask the Lord's blessing as we study together, and so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of being in your house. How wonderful it is for your family to gather together in fellowship and in worship to you. You deserve our worship for you are our creator and our redeemer. We ask that you will bless our service this morning, that it might be acceptable in your sight. I thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who were here in the first presentation in this series, we discuss the time and place in which we would expect the gift of prophecy to arise in the remnant church. And we followed a very careful line of reasoning. We took the prophecy of Daniel 7, the prophecy of Revelation 12, and the prophecy of Revelation 13. And we showed that the three prophecies are actually parallel. And they moved from the time of Babylon down to Medo-Persia, then to Greece, then to Rome, to the ten divisions of Rome, through the period of the 1260 years in which the little horn has dominion in Europe, and finally taking us to the year 1798. And then we noticed that after 1798 we would expect a remnant to rise which keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we would expect the gift of prophecy to show up after the year 1798 in the United States of America among a people who keep the commandments of God and who have in their midst, of course, the gift of prophecy. Now I'd like to begin our study, this our second study, by reading a text that we find in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. This is a verse that we read last night and we will be reading it quite frequently throughout this seminar. Revelation 12 and verse 17. This is the culmination of the chain prophecy that we studied in our last presentation. It says there, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And now notice two characteristics, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now in our study today, we particularly want to study what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. Now in order to understand this text a little bit better, we have to go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. We've noticed that the remnant has the testimony of Jesus Christ. But the question is, what is that testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation 19 and verse 10 explains it by saying, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. This is probably, probably Gabriel who is speaking. He says to John, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Notice that the brethren of John have the testimony of Jesus. And what is that testimony? The last part of the verse. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Clear definition, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now Revelation chapter 22 and verse 9 adds an additional detail. Revelation 22 and verse 9. Once again this angel appears to John and John feels the urge to worship him. And notice what we find in verse 9. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, 
For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Now let's put all three of these texts together. Revelation 12, 17 says that the remnant has the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19 verse 10 explains that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And Revelation 22 verse 9 emphasizes that those who have the testimony of Jesus are whom? The prophets. Because the brethren of John have the testimony of Jesus. But in Revelation 22 verse 9 it says that the brethren of John are prophets. So the testimony of Jesus means to be a prophet. In other words, the remnant church at the very end of time would have the gift of prophecy manifested within it. We are to expect an end time prophet. After all, the Bible says that in the end time there are going to be false prophets. The devil wouldn't feel any necessity to establish false prophets unless God was going to manifest the true gift of prophecy. In fact, the Bible teaches that the gift of prophecy will continue till the very end of time until this world wraps up and everything comes to an end. Now what is the gift of prophecy? I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I would like to read two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, actually the verses are 14 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 14 and 18. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul compares the church to a body. He says the following, For the body is not one member, but many. But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. So notice that the Apostle Paul compares the church to a body. Each member is a part of the body, and each member has a particular gift. Some of those gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, among other things. Now the question is, which part of the body is equivalent to the gift of prophecy? If each part of the body is equivalent to one of the gifts of the Spirit, then we would expect the gift of prophecy to be equivalent to one of the parts of the body. Now the question is, which part of the body does the gift of prophecy relate to? Well, the Bible is very clear. Go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. Notice that prophets were called by a strange name before they were called prophets. It says there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9, Before in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a what? A seer. What were prophets called before? They were called seers. In other words, the gift of prophecy has to do with what? With the eyes, the part of the body that is the eyes. The gift of prophecy is the eyes of the church, in other words. Now go with me also to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Once again the same idea of prophecy being related to vision. It says there, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Notice, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now I know we use this verse to say that we need to be people of vision that we need to be visionaries, in other words. But the text is not talking about having vision for the future or being visionaries. The word vision that is used here is the identical one that is employed in Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel had the vision of the beasts. In other words, this is talking about a prophetic vision. He, in other words, the church when it has no gift of prophecy, it is going to perish because it has no what? It has no vision. Now go with me also to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and uh, I would like to read just a portion of verse 18. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. This is speaking to the church of Laodicea. 
And notice what we are told. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. But how does Jesus see the church of Laodicea? He says, And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and what's the next word? And blind, and naked. Now what is the church of Laodicea? That must be the Methodists and the Presbyterians, right? No. In fact, we know as Seventh-day Adventists that the Laodicean church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's the last church of the book of Revelation. And I want you to notice that we are told that the church of Laodicea, one of the characteristics is that the church of Laodicea is what? Is blind. Now the question is, why would the church of Laodicea be blind? If the gift of prophecy is the eyes of the church, it must mean that the church of Laodicea does not pay attention to what? To the gift of prophecy. Because the gift of prophecy is the vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Because we're told by the Apostle Paul that the church is as a body. And we notice that prophets used to be called seers before they were called prophets. In other words, the eyes of the church are the gift of prophecy. Obviously, the church of Laodicea, which is our church, is not really paying attention to the spirit of prophecy. And therefore, one of the characteristics is that the church is walking around in blindness. Isn't it ironic that the church, which has the testimony of Jesus Christ... According to Revelation 12, verse 17, is the very church that walks around how? That walks around blind. Because it has ignored, to a great degree, the gift that God has given to it, the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Now the question is, why is it called the testimony of Jesus? Why is the gift of prophecy called the testimony of Jesus? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. Did you know that all of the prophets of the Bible had the testimony of Jesus? Every single one of the prophets of the Bible had the testimony of Jesus. And the reason is that the prophets pointed forward to the coming of Christ. They gave testimony about Jesus. For example, Jesus once said to the Jewish nation uh, in John chapter 5 and verse 39, He said, You search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. See, testify is related to the word testimony. In other words, the prophets, the writers of the Bible, gave testimony to Jesus. They pointed to Jesus Christ. Notice Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2. Here we're told that John had the testimony of Jesus. It says there, who bear record of the word of God, speaking about John, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. In other words, John had the testimony of Jesus because John was a prophet. Now notice also 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21. And this is a particularly interesting pair of verses. It says there in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 about the prophets of the Old Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Remember these are the prophets of the Old Testament. They're inquiring about salvation. And searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you. See, the prophets, they searched very carefully about the salvation which was going to come in the future. And then it continues saying in this passage that they searched for the manner of time and the way in which the Christ was going to come. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In other words, the prophets of the Old Testament searched and investigated to find out the time and the place in which the Messiah, the Savior, would come. 
This shows that the central theme of the prophets was none, none less than Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected and ascended. The reason why the gift of prophecy is called the testimony of Jesus Christ is because the prophets gave witness to Jesus. They pointed to Jesus and they searched in the scriptures as well as through prayer when Jesus would come and what Jesus would do. And this applies not only to the first coming, but it also applies to the second coming of Christ. Now notice also 1 John chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8. John chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8. Here it's talking about John the Baptist. Notice once again the same idea that the prophets give testimony to Jesus. It says there, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. Now I need to explain something about the word witness. We'll come back to it in a minute. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And then we're told that John the Baptist was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. Now that little word witness, see in, in English we have the word testify and we have the word witness. A witness testifies. Uh, in Spanish, for example, there's only one word, the word testigo, testimonio, it's all the same word. The word witness here is the very same Greek word that is translated testify. In other words, he gave, came to give testimony about the light. That's what it means, he came to give witness to the light. In other words, the reason why uh, this gift is called the testimony of Jesus is because the prophets give witness or give testimony or point towards Jesus Christ. Now the question is why is it called the spirit of prophecy? It's called the testimony of Jesus because the prophets point to Jesus. But why is it called the spirit of prophecy? Well the fact is the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the spirit of prophecy or is given by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the prophet speaks, he is speaking what the Holy Spirit gives to him. And therefore to reject the voice of a prophet means to reject the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's called the spirit of prophecy because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the gift of prophecy to the individual who speaks for God. Let's notice a few verses about that. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter uh, 1 and verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. It says there, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by whom? As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the prophets in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament spoke not out of their own heart or out of their own mind, but they spoke as the information was given to them by the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why this gift is called the Spirit of Prophecy. Now notice also Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12 on this same point. Why is it called the Spirit of Prophecy? Zechariah chapter 7 verse 12 says, Yea, they made their hearts as adamant as stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord hath sent, now notice this, in His Spirit by the former prophets. How is it that the former prophets spoke according to this text? It was through the Spirit. And it continues saying, Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. So once again we find that the prophets spoke in the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit gave them the gift. So not only is uh, the gift of prophecy a testimony about Jesus, but its origin is found in the Holy Spirit who gives it. Now this is very serious. I've taken the time to point this out because if people reject the gift of prophecy, they are rejecting first of all Jesus to whom the gift of prophecy points and secondly they are rejecting the Holy Spirit who gave the gift of prophecy in the first place. Very very serious matter. Notice also Revelation chapter 22 
Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Once again the same idea that it's the Holy Spirit that gives the gift of prophecy. It says there, Jesus is speaking, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Notice that Jesus has sent his angel to John to testify about Jesus. Now you say, I thought you said that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives the message to John. Well, we've studied before that the Holy Spirit imparts his message to the prophets through the ministration of whom? Through the ministration of the angels. That's why in Revelation it speaks about John receiving a message from an angel, but in other places it says that John was in the Spirit when he was in vision. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit giving testimony to Jesus through the ministration of an angel who is actually giving the information to the prophet. So what have we seen so far? We've seen that the remnant church is going to have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy means to have a prophet in its midst. We've noticed that the gift of prophecy is what? Is the eyes of the church because the prophets were called seers. Where there is no vision the people perish. We've noticed in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18 that the Laodicean church walks around stumbling, blind. It must be because the Laodicean church, even though it has a prophet, is not really paying any attention to what the prophet has to say. We've noticed also that the testimony of Jesus is so because the prophets give witness to Christ. They point forward to Christ, to everything that Jesus was going to do at his first coming and everything that Jesus is going to do at his second coming. We also notice that it's called the spirit of prophecy because it is the Holy Spirit that gives this gift through the ministration of the angels to the prophet so that the prophet can then impart it to us. Incidentally, let me just make a little parenthesis here. It's interesting to see in Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 that there's a process that God follows in imparting the message to the prophet. The order is this. God gives the message to Jesus. Jesus gives the message to the angel. The angel gives the message to John. And John writes it down and imparts it to the church. And actually the Holy Spirit is not directly mentioned there, but we know that when the prophet was in vision, it was the Holy Spirit that actually gave him the information. But Revelation emphasizes that the angels play a very important role in the impartation of the information in the visionary experience. So what does it mean to reject the gift of prophecy or to criticize the gift of prophecy? I guess it would mean that we're criticizing Jesus because Jesus is the one spoken of in prophecy. I guess it would also mean that we're criticizing the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one who gave this gift to the church in the first place. And so to reject the gift of prophecy or to downgrade the gift of prophecy or to ignore the gift of prophecy means to ignore Jesus. It means to ignore the Holy Spirit. Very, very serious matter. Now let me talk to you a little bit about to whom the prophets are sent. Do you know that most of the time in the Bible prophets are not, not sent to people of the world? There are a few that were sent to worldlings, like for example, we're studying the lessons on Jonah this quarter in the Sabbath school lesson. Well, you know, we know that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites, but even the message of, of Jonah is a message to Israel because Jonah represents Israel. Israel flees from their mission, just like Jonah fled from his mission. And God has to nudge Jonah to witness to the nations as he tries to nudge Israel to witness to the nations. So even though it's Jonah speaking to the Ninevites who are not Hebrews, still it's a message to Israel. The fact is that in the great majority of the cases in the Bible, prophets are not sent to pagans, prophets are not sent to worldlings, prophets are sent to those who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible? 
Now the question is, how do we know that? Well, the Bible says so. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And notice what he has to say about tongues, first of all. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So tongues are for unbelievers, right? According to the Apostle Paul. But now notice, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. For whom is the gift of prophecy? It is for believers within the church. Now my question is, all throughout the Bible, how were prophets usually treated by God's people? Oh, they were loved and embraced. Everybody just loved them so much. Oh, come Jeremiah, we love you. Isaiah, you're so marvelous, Isaiah. So nice to have you here. Oh, Daniel, you're so wonderful. Is that the way it was? The fact is that those who hated the prophets the most were the very people to whom they were sent. God's own professed people rejected the testimony of Jesus and they rejected the spirit of prophecy, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Notice for example in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, 15 and 16 is giving the summary of Israel's history before the Babylonian captivity. And it says, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised His words and misused His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people till there was no what? till there was no remedy. This is the way that they treated the prophets in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, 29 and 30 amplifies this point by saying that they killed the prophets, they stoned the messengers that were sent to them, that is to God's people, they totally rejected the message and actually they filled up their cup according to Jesus because they rejected the messages that God in love sent by His prophets. Notice also Isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 30 and verses 8 and 9. Uh, here we find uh, how Israel treated the prophets and what the end result was. It says, Now go, write it before them a table, and note it in a book. God is saying to, to the prophet Isaiah, I want you to write this down for posterity's sake. This is important. That it may be for, ta for the time come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. And then he continues saying, which say to the seers, see not. In other words, they're saying to the prophets, we don't want to hear what you have to say. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. In other words, be politically correct. Don't ruffle any feathers. Don't meddle in our affairs. Prophesy deceits, it continues saying. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. In other words, we, we want God, yes, but we don't want to follow exactly what God has to say. Israel was saying, get the seers gone from us, get the prophets away from us, we don't want to hear what they have to say. It's amazing that the prophets to the greatest degree were always hated by the people that they were sent to. Now let me ask you, should it surprise us then if in the end time God raises up a prophet and that prophet is not like that well? You know, I would think that uh, if a prophet rises in the last days and everybody loves that prophet, I would tend to believe that that is a false prophet. You say, how do you know that? Well, because Jesus said so. Go with me to Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. Very interesting. Jesus uh, is speaking here. And he says, uh, well, it's obviously not Luke 6 verse 36, but anyway, the gist of it, 626, okay, 626. It says here, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Woe to you when everyone should what? 
should speak well of you. For so did their fathers to whom? To the false prophets. So what happens when everybody loves someone who claims to be a prophet? You're supposed to wonder whether that person is really a true prophet. Jesus said it, not me. Now there are lots of so-called prophets in the world today that multitudes come and they just uh, practically bow at their feet. People just love them. But the fact is that in the Bible the prophets were hated. You know, I could mention Jeremiah. He was thrown into the dungeon. The king burned his scroll. I mean, he was hated. You can talk about Isaiah. Isaiah was put in a hollow log and then the log was cut in half. You can talk about Elijah who was persecuted mercilessly by Jezebel. You can talk about John the Baptist who was put in a dungeon and practically abandoned there and finally was beheaded. You know, we could go all through the Bible and talk about prophets and prophets were simply hated. They were despised because they were meddlers. They were politically incorrect. They told people what they did not want to hear. Do you know the Bible says that it's a serious matter to reject the voice of a prophet? It's a dangerous thing. We all know the story of Elisha. Have you ever read it in 2 Kings 2, 23 and 24? It seems like Elisha had a similar problem to the one that I have as well as some others here. He was balding. <laughs> it's amazing. It seems as time goes by more and more people bald. When I see a person who's my age and has a full head of hair, I'm envious. But anyway, Elisha apparently was going bald. And he had told Israel that, uh, you know, Elijah had been translated to heaven. And the people were saying, yeah, right. Where do, you have him, where do you have him? Where is he hiding? He said, no, really? Elijah has ascended to heaven. And the people were saying, yeah, right. And the parents started telling their children, that guy's out of his mind, that Elisha. Very dangerous to talk to your kids badly about the gift of prophecy. Very dangerous business, this story tells us. And so it happens that uh, the parents were telling the children, you know, this guy's crazy, don't pay any attention to him. You know, ha, Elijah went to heaven. Who's going to believe such a thing? And so one day the Bible says that Elisha was walking down the road and 42 children were coming. You know, these are the stories that sometimes we don't like to read from the Bible. Because we say, oh wow, you know, that, that doesn't fit my view of God. Maybe it's because we have the wrong view of God. That God is uh, just only lovey-dovey, you know, and that God is not a God of justice, a God that expects certain things from His people. He expects respect from, for His prophets. Do you know when prophets are rejected, God takes it personally. Because they are His personal representatives. And so Elisha's walking down the road and these 42 children come and they say, Go up, you too, thou bald head. Go up, go, go, you too, thou bald head. And the Bible says that Elisha turned around and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. See, he was speaking in the name of the Lord, and now he curses them in the name of the Lord. You say, wow, this is an amazing story. And the Bible says that two she-bears came out of the woods. The Bible doesn't say that the, the she-bears killed the children, but many of them were hurt. You see, God takes the treatment of his prophets very seriously. And then you have the case of Moses. Remember the story of Moses? Miriam and Aaron criticizing Moses. And by the way, Hosea chapter 12 says that Moses was a prophet. He was not only a leader of Israel out of Egypt. He was a prophet according to scripture. There are many prophecies that Moses gave. But anyway, they were criticizing the leadership of Moses. They were saying, we, couldn't somebody else lead Israel just as well? And besides this Moses, look, he married a woman that has dark skin. I call that racism. Wouldn't you? And you thought that racism was a contemporary problem only. It's as old as the world. And so the Bible says that God didn't do anything, right? Oh, yes, he did. The Bible says that Miriam was afflicted with what? With leprosy. And it was only through the pleading of the prophet Moses that the leprosy was listed, lifted from Miriam. God takes very seriously how we treat his prophets. 
because it's the testimony of Jesus. It is the spirit of prophecy that is at stake here, the Holy Spirit speaking. And then you have the story of Samuel. You know, Israel wanted a king like the surrounding nations. They said, we want a king. And God says through Samuel, listen, it's not a good idea to have a king because you're going to have to pay, first of all, taxes. Now, see, taxes aren't anything new. They were charged back in Israel's day. You're going to have to pay taxes. And furthermore, your children, your boys, are going to have to go over to Iraq. No, not necessarily Iraq. Or out to war. In other words, the draft is going to be enacted. And they said, we don't care. We want a king. Now I want you to notice, this is a text I would like us to look up. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7. God tries to encourage Samuel because Samuel is kind of discouraged because God has given this message and the people don't want to pay any attention to it. And he feels rejected. And God is going to tell Samuel, don't you worry about it. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Whom did Israel reject when they rejected the prophetic counsel that God gave through Samuel? They rejected the Lord. They rejected God. To reject the testimony of Jesus, to reject the spirit of prophecy, means to reject the person who gave it in the first place. Now these are negative examples of people who reacted wrongly to the gift of prophecy. But we have examples in the Bible of people reacting positively to the prophetic voice. I thank God that we have some positive examples. For example, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we find a very interesting story. There, were, there was a triple alliance that was coming against Israel to destroy them. And their number, according to this chapter, was as the sand of the sea, and Israel was just a handful of people. It appeared that Israel was going to be destroyed by this army which appeared as the stars of heaven or the sand of the sea. The Bible tells us, that as the can congregation gathered together to decide what they were going to do because of this threat, God gave the gift of prophecy to four men in the midst of the congregation. You can find them mentioned in verse 14 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. They're hard to pronounce. That's why I'm not going to read the verse. <laughs> but you can read it. So anyway, these four men receive the gift of prophecy. And they say, don't be afraid, Israel. God is going to take care of it because the battle is the Lord's. Just trust the Lord, and the Lord is going to come through. And then, of course, King Jehoshaphat picks up on this. And he says in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, And they rose early in the morning, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa, where the battle was to take place. And they went forth. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Now notice the encouragement that is given by the king. Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so ye shall what? So ye shall prosper. Now, was it easy for them to believe in the prophets, in these four prophets, under those circumstances? Not really, because the enemy was like the sand of the sea. In fact, Jehoshaphat then organizes them and he says, I want you to go out to battle in a very strange way of doing battle. He says, I want you to go out to battle and I want you to sing praises to the Lord of Israel. Maybe that has a lesson for us. Maybe when we have a, an awesome enemy that's coming after us and trying to destroy us and tempting us and giving us troubles, maybe song would be a good way to defeat him or to defeat them. This is a strange way of going to battle. God says, you know, go out to battle and just sing praises to the Lord. Now, it wasn't easy to follow this counsel. 
because uh, the enemy was awesome. I mean, Israel probably could have thought, <laughs> you know, what is this? God telling us that we should go out and face such a huge army just singing? without using any weapons, and yet the Bible says that Israel believed God. They believed His prophets. God had said, if you believe His prophets, you will what? You will prosper. And so the Bible says that they went out, and they sang praises to the Lord of Israel. And you know what happened? The Bible tells us that all of these armies became confused. All of the multitudes that were coming against Israel became confused. And it says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 that instead of using their swords to destroy Israel, they used their swords to destroy one another. And when the battle ended, there was not one soldier of the enemy left. Believe his prophets and you shall be prospered. You know, our church faces great perplexities today. Great financial challenges. Great challenges in the realm of education. Great challenges in the area of the health system. Great challenges in the area of theology. Great challenges in the area of lifestyle and church organization. Do we still believe that if we believe His prophets, His people will prosper? Do we still believe that if we trust the end time prophet that God has raised up for these times that God's people will prosper? I believe so. And I believe that many of the perplexities that we're caught up in is because we have failed to listen to the prophetic voice given to us in the testimony of Jesus for these last days. The gift of prophecy manifested in the person of Ellen White. Ellen White has given a very striking statement in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 48, which I would like to read. You know, you go to the internet today and you find all kinds of things against Ellen White. She was a plagiarist. Some people say that she was a lunatic. Other people says that she, say that she was an epileptic, uh, uh, you, that you can't really trust what she says because she borrowed from here and there you know, and she was mistaken about this and that. You find all kinds of information on the internet against the gift of prophecy. May I make a recommendation? Don't get your information about Ellen White from the internet. Why don't you just go to the books and look it up for yourself? And study everything she had to say. Not only what they're saying on the internet. You know, Tom Dorsch a few, uh, a few years ago brought me three things that he found on the internet and he was alarmed. He says, Pastor, how do we deal with these issues? So I sat down with him. I said, with this issue we deal it this way and this way and this way. I showed him all of the context of what Ellen White has to say. He says, oh, well that's interesting. I hadn't looked at it from that perspective. You see, that's only one side. And I've discovered something. You never form your opinion of someone based on what their enemies or their friends say. Because their friends will make them look better than they are and their enemies will make them look worse than they are. You have to go and discover it how? You have to go and discover it first hand for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good and that God has called a prophet for these last days. This is the statement, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 48. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies. Testimonies is uh, the way in which she's talking about her writings. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. I believe we're seeing that in the church today. I believe we're seeing it not only by the attack against Ellen White, I believe we're seeing it by the fact that Ellen White is almost totally ignored in many churches. In fact, it might surprise you uh, that someone, when I came to Fresno Central Church a few years ago, actually I just arrived, uh, I'll have to tell you the story of my adventures soon after my arrival, uh, but uh, somebody said to me, now pastor, there's one thing that we want to uh, hear from the platform, and that's the Bible, and there's something that we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear any quotations from Ellen White. That's what a church member told me. And I said, wow, that's going to be difficult. <laughs> because I fully believe in the spirit of prophecy, and I believe that she amplifies and she explains Bible truth. And so I'm going to, I'm going to use Ellen White in the service, in my sermons. 
as corroboration of what the Bible teaches. Uh, needless to say, that person no longer is a member of this church. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I'm here because I believe God has called me to present things the way He wants them presented. He wants me to present the truth. It's not because I'm so great, but because His truth is great. When I received the call to be a minister, I promised the Lord that, you know, I would read Scripture, and I would read the Spirit of Prophecy, and I would present it as He wants me to present it. In the kindest way possible, but also in the most direct way possible. She continues saying, the workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. See, the hatred is going to be satanic, and it says here that he's going to try to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. Now why? Notice, for this reason. Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions or bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. In other words, if the counsels of the Spirit of Prophecy are heeded, we can be safe, we can prosper, we can be sure that we're on the right track. But if we ignore them, we will be taken over by the many delusions of Satan. You see, God has raised up the gift of prophecy in order to amplify, specify, clarify what is contained in the Bible. We're going to study this farther on in our series. He has not raised up the prophet to give new truth, but to amplify and to explain the truths already given in detail so that we can remain firm on God's side in these last days. In the same book, Selective Messages, Volume 1, I believe it's page 40, she has another very interesting statement. She saw a group of people in the time of trouble, and they were without shelter and without refuge. And she heard them complaining and saying, Lord, how come you didn't tell us that this time was going to be so terrible so that we could have appropriately prepared? And the Lord is going to answer, I tried to warn you. I gave you testimonies of the Spirit. And you rejected them. And if you had accepted them, you would have been prepared for this severe time of trial. Folks, there is so much light in what we call the red books. Isn't it time that we shake the dust off of the books? I think so. You know, we claim to follow the Bible. We say, the Bible only. Nothing more than the Bible. But we're actually not even obeying the Bible, are we? It's an excuse. So why not shake the dust off the red books, open, up, open them up and start reading them again and applying the principles to our lives. Our lives will change. You know, I threw out a challenge a while back and that was that you try and read the conflict series, all five books, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles and Great Controversy. Read them all in a year. Do you know that if you only read 12 pages a day, that's difficult, isn't it? 12 pages a day. Oh, 12 pages, Pastor. Have mercy. Anybody can read 12 pages while you're on your break, right? If you only read 12 pages, you would be able to read all five books in one year. And I threw out the challenge. And I know some people took me up on the challenge because they told me so, and others are doing it. I assure you that if you choose to do that, in one year your life will not be the same it'll be so much better. It'll be so much more blessed by God. You know, I once had uh, an elder take me into his office. He invited me to his home to eat. And uh, he took me into his office at home. And he showed me all of the Spirit of Prophecy books. This was in a Hispanic country. I imagine that there must have been at least 40 books there. And they were all covered with their cellophane paper. And I looked at him and I said, wow, you have a lot of books. 
uh, I said, uh, how come they're covered with cellophane? He says, well, you know, if, if, they're, if I don't leave the cellophane, they'll get old. The pages will get yellow. I said, listen, what good does it do for you to have those books covered with cellophane? Rip the cellophane off and read them. It doesn't matter if, if, if uh, they get old, because by reading them, you'll be prepared for the kingdom. I pray to God that we'll recover this precious gift. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for having been with us in our study today. Lord, I ask that you will instill in our hearts a love, a deep love for the spirit of prophecy which you have given. Help us to read it and assimilate the principles that our lives might be transformed and changed. I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.